It's early in the morning of April 15th, 1912. A slight chop has developed on the sea surface, but just hours ago, the ocean was a flat calm. The Cunard steamer, RMS Carpathia, has raced through the night to attend to a disaster. Now it has arrived on scene and prepares to take on passengers. In the night, the RMS Titanic, on its maiden voyage to New York, has encountered an iceberg, and in the pitch black of night, without a moon, it has collided stem on with the ice and has settled heavily by the head. Passengers begin to abandon ship to be picked up by Carpathia and other steamers which have arrived on site, alerted by Titanic's wireless distress calls. Titanic's complex watertight compartment system has held up, and the ship is not actually sinking, but the ship's bow has been crushed up to the foremast, and hundreds are dead. Of course, this is not how history transpired. Titanic didn't collide with the iceberg bow on. Instead, its crew attempted to turn the ship out of harm's way, and its side was open to the seawater, damaging enough of the ship's watertight compartments to sink her. But all the evidence is there to suggest that if Titanic had struck the berg at a 90 degree angle, it would have survived, albeit with heavy damage and possibly hundreds of lives lost. It would have been a catastrophe for the ship's owners, White Starline, but the Titanic would have stayed afloat. And here is why. In command on the bridge that night was First Officer William Murdoch, and so far it had been a peaceful, uneventful night until around 11.40pm, when he and the ship's lookouts in the crow's nest high up in the mast spotted a black mass ahead. It was an iceberg and Murdoch had only seconds to act. Of course, it was his duty to avoid the iceberg by all means necessary. In a previous video I explained how Murdoch tried to do this by porting around the iceberg, but it was just too late, and the Titanic sideswiped the berg and its fate was sealed. He could never have known that Titanic would strike a glancing blow that would open up its side. He absolutely did the right thing and to the very best of his ability. To assume in that moment that ramming the iceberg head on was the best course of action would have been insane and resulted in serious consequences for Murdoch after the collision. Ships are big, heavy masses of weight lumbering through the ocean at speed. It's hard to steer them out of danger and even harder to slow and stop them. Because of this, there are hundreds and hundreds of examples of dramatic collisions from history. But believe it or not, Titanic was definitely not the first time a ship has had a nasty run-in with an iceberg. For example, the SS Arizona was a 450 foot long, 5,000 gross registered ton ship operated by the Guiden Line. In 1879, the ship was steaming at its top speed, 15 knots, when it collided with an iceberg stem on. The ship's bow was badly crushed up, but the ship survived the impact and sailed to Canada for temporary repair. Her bow was rebuilt, and the ship went on to have an almost 50 year long career. The SS Grampian had a very similar experience. She had her own run in with an iceberg in 1919. In fact, she was about double the size of Arizona and was sailing to Liverpool with 750 passengers when, in a fog, an iceberg was spotted dead ahead, and she contacted the berg bow on. 40 feet of Grampian's bow was crushed up, killing two stewards, but the watertight compartments held, and the ship did not sink. She too was also fully repaired and put back into service. How on earth did these ships survive these collisions? They both happened at a decent amount of speed and resulted in catastrophic damage, and yet both times the ships were recovered and put back into service. One of the false claims made about the Titanic in a head-on collision scenario is that the force of the collision would be sufficient to send a shockwave of force throughout the entire hull of the ship, causing rivets to pop out of place, jamming the watertight doors and sending the ship to the bottom after breaking apart in minutes. But of course, as Grampian and Arizona demonstrate, this is just not the case. The hull was a complicated, honeycomb-like structure of steel beams, girders and plates. All of these hundreds and thousands of individual pieces of steel were riveted together with millions of rivets. But here is the secret to steel's success. It's actually really soft. Not soft to the touch of course, you wouldn't be sleeping on a steel pillow anytime soon, but it is flexible and it can bend under pressure. This effect is called elasticity, the degree to which an object can bend or be deformed without fracturing and then return to its previous shape. This is really useful because ships, by nature, undergo massive amounts of stress 
as they sail over huge waves, so the hull needs to be able to bend and sag without breaking. But steel also offers a good degree of plasticity. That is, to say how much the steel can bend or be deformed permanently before failing. Author and researcher Shengming Zhang does a spectacular job of outlining all of the forces at play when ships collide with static objects. You see, when a ship is moving at near full speed and it hits a static object, like say an iceberg, it begins to fold up by the bow. In Titanic's day they referred to this as telescoping, and it's essentially exactly as it sounds. We saw this with the Grampian, the Arizona, and dozens of other ships from history. The bow of the ship, that huge honeycomb structure of steel girders, beams, frames and bulkheads, suddenly begins to crush up. This is because, like I mentioned earlier, ships are huge and fast with a massive amount of forward momentum. When the ship collides with the iceberg, there is suddenly released a massive amount of energy. And all of that force has got to go somewhere. But where? Some would have you believe that the force of the collision is exerted on the entire ship's hull at once, causing failures all the way along. But we know that this isn't the case. You remember when I mentioned plasticity? Steel bends. It's not like glass. It won't just shatter. And as it bends, it absorbs an amount of force. Zhang's 1999 paper draws a direct relationship between the amount of building material employed in the ship's construction that is to say, the sheer amount of steel holding it together, and the amount of force that the bow of the ship is able to absorb or dissipate as it is crushed up. And it just so happens that transatlantic ocean liners, like the Titanic, were designed and built to be extremely strong as they battered their way through the North Atlantic. Therefore, they employed an awful lot of steel. The effect of this force dissipation is enormous. Zhang calculates that a 150,000 dead weight ton tanker, moving at around 18 knots, would experience bow crushing of around 15 to 20 meters, or say 65 feet. But the ship would survive. The energy of the impact of Titanic's collision would also be absorbed by the crushing itself. Specifically, the effects of plastic tension, crushing, folding and tearing as the bow broke up. It's not impossible to think that as Titanic's bow crushed in on itself and the ship was slowed from 21 knots to a stop in just seconds, passengers at Titanic's very stern would only maybe have felt a slight jar and maybe not even be thrown off their feet as the bow's own destruction absorbed all that energy from the collision and brought the ship to a gradual stop. At one of the inquiries held after the Titanic's loss, one of the ship's main designers, Edward Wilding, took the stands and testified saying, I am afraid she would have crumpled up in stopping herself. The momentum of the ship would have crushed the bows for 80 or perhaps 100 feet. The commissioner of the inquiry was curious and he asked, Your opinion is that the ship would have suffered that crushing in in the first two compartments, but that the shock would have shattered or loosened the rivets in any other part of the ship? Wilding responded, Not sufficiently, as it would take a considerable length, 80 or 100 feet to bring it up. It is not a shock, it is a pressure that lasts three or four seconds, five seconds perhaps, and whilst it is a big pressure, it is not in the nature of a sharp blow. In fact, Wilding even cited the Arizona collision as evidence. I believe the ship would have been saved, and I am strengthened in that belief by the case which your lordship will remember, where one large North Atlantic steamer some 34 years ago did go stem on into an iceberg and did come into a port, and she was going fast. Wilding was asked, what you mean is that the ship would have telescoped herself? And he responded, yes, up against the iceberg. That is what happened to the Arizona. Impacting the iceberg head on and at speed, Titanic's bow would have been crushed perhaps as far aft as the forward mast. The forecastle would have been gone, and with it the bunks and berths for the ship's 250 or so stokers and trimmers, the majority of whom would have been asleep at the time of the collision and would have been simply atomized as the bow crushed up around them. Murdoch ordered the watertight doors closed before the collision, so they would have been safely shut preventing widespread flooding. The forwardmost cargo hold would be lost, along with all its cargo, but crucially the boiler rooms would be safe. So in theory, the ship would be still able to operate under its own power and generate its own electricity. If Wilding was right, and the first two or three watertight compartments were either destroyed or flooded, 
then Titanic would still have stayed afloat because she was designed to stay afloat with four of her watertight compartments flooded. With the watertight doors shut, there would have been no way for the water to flood aft into the other compartments, and therefore Titanic could have stayed afloat. Captain Smith would then have ordered a distress call, and Carpathia would be the ship to answer. Smith would have organised an evacuation of the ship, and because the scene would have been much more calm and less frantic than the actual sinking, passengers would probably have boarded the lifeboats from the A-deck promenade. Once Carpathia arrived on scene, Titanic's lifeboats would have ferried the passengers off, while Titanic sat ominously low in the water, with its forwardmost compartment flooded, but safe for the time being. Once empty of passengers, Captain Smith may have shored up the damage, perhaps with temporary wooden structures, and sail Titanic maybe on to Canada, perhaps Halifax in Nova Scotia, where temporary repairs could be made before the ship could be sailed back to Harlan and Wolf in Belfast, where for the next few months her bow would be totally rebuilt and she would be put back into service for the 1913 season. And that 